Lord, give us inquiring and discerning hearts. Give us courage to will and to persevere. Give us a spirit to know you and to love you. We pray, Lord, that you too would give us the gifts of joy and of wonder in all your marvelous works. And we pray all this in the name of the Holy One, whose love knows no bounds. Amen. Good morning, friends. Welcome on this Feast of Our Lord's Baptism. It is wonderful to be with all of you here in this space and those of you who are joining us online. As uh, many of you are no doubt aware, the world, the Anglican world in particular, have been mourning the late great Archbishop Desmond Tutu since his death on the Feast of St. Stephen on December 26th, just two short weeks ago. The remembrances have been vast and varied, celebrating everything from his very public work as the chair of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission to his very private devotional practices of prayer and study as a baptized Christian, become priest, become bishop, become archbishop, become global celebrity. Not unlike our own presiding bishop, Curry, the global stage provided Archbishop Tutu entree into the hearts and the minds and the imaginations of many who would otherwise continue to either ignore the church or to malign it, particularly in its most public forms as a primarily oppressive force in the world, regressive, judgmental, hypocritical, self-interested. But the late Archbishop modeled to the world something quite unexpected, actually, a fierce commitment to justice, a tender embodiment of compassion, a thoughtful practitioner of truthful reckoning and practical reparation, and a joyful witness to the hope of universal transformation. And you know what? He did most of this while traveling around atop a bicycle to boot. In all of this, he rekindled the deep convictions of his fellow Anglicans, and he piqued the curiosity of the faith's most ardent critics. Predictably, this level of notoriety comes as a mixed blessing, almost too good to be true. On the one hand, modeling an inspirational life grounded in real-world challenges. Yet, on the other hand, modeling an aspirational life grounded in otherworldly hope. Great for him, but perhaps out of reach for the rest of us, right? Such is the danger, it seems, of wide public recognition. The ease of misunderstanding the message and the even greater ease of distancing oneself from the messenger. But the archbishop's disposition toward life, toward God, and toward others, it is available and expected of all of us. All of us, not merely the religious celebrities, not merely our modern-day saints. Through the practice of daily prayer, daily study, daily service of care and concern for others, Archbishop Tutu lent to us the practical means by which to share in the very life of God in ways both large and small, seen and unseen. Each of us invited and equipped to love with the love of God, transforming all the many worlds we each occupy, not only out of the unique gifts with which we're each equipped, but out of the universal riches with which the whole creation is infused. And this seems to have been the Archbishop's greatest, most lasting gift, the reminder that the good news of God and Christ has no vehicle, no voice but us, as we are where we are. That is, his life reminds us that it is a firm affirmation of each of our own human particularity. This gift is coupled with the Archbishop's most enduring challenge, particularly apropos today amidst our re-emerging political tribalisms. That's the conviction 
that this same good news must be good news for all of us if it's to be at all good for any of us, requiring that we recognize each other as children of God, one of Tutu's favorite phrases, children of God, fellow inheritors of God's universal blessing. He's not speaking of Christians merely. Archbishop Tutu's gift and challenge to us both grow naturally, if also intentionally, from the baptism he shares with us and with our Lord, whose baptismal feast we celebrate today, always, every year, on the first Sunday following the Feast of the Epiphany. We have swiftly, over the course of a mere six weeks, journeyed from Advent's prophetic language of hopes and fears through the angelic language of dreams fulfilled at Christmas, from the flickering flame of the word made flesh through the murderous reactivity of an empire on notice. And in just these last four days, we've traveled from the cribside delight of the nations gathered to honor Jesus as king, priest, and sacrifice to this day, today, on which we celebrate the creekside dawning of Jesus as God's own beloved son. The same king of kings and prince of peace who was born to us a mere two weeks ago now joins us in these baptismal waters as a full-grown 30-something. A full-grown 30-something. His precocious private years giving way to today's public proclamation of identity and purpose. The meaning and the message of this occasion is twofold each certain to offend the sensibilities of those gathered. For those expecting an otherworldly Messiah, perfect and pure and placed high upon their idealized pedestal, Jesus affirms his deep and abiding solidarity with his people, with all people. He is firmly rooted in the Jewish tradition. He shares the best of his people's hopes and expectations, and he practices his faith within the practical confines of his own time and place. He is, as it were, a local hero, a champion for those nearest him. However, for those expecting a narrow sectarian mascot to trumpet their own tribal grudge, a Messiah whose vision is national and whose priorities are perhaps ethnic or religious or privileged in some other way, God intervenes to claim Jesus at his baptism, thereby proclaiming publicly that this Messiah's vocation and by extension Israel's vocation and ours with them is cosmic in reach. God affirms that the breadth and the depth of this Messiah's saving love extends to everyone and everything in every place at every time. Everything that springs from the creative genius and loving purpose of the Creator, whose very mind, whose very logos, takes on flesh in Jesus, who we are now to understand shares the very substance of the Godhead, the Creator's very heart, the Creator's very mind, which was, we are told, in the beginning, through which all things came to be. All of this, all of this reality of Jesus and thereby of us is revealed to be true today. He is, as it were, for us, for all of us, not by any merit or category of our own, but by virtue of our presence and participation within the vast, complicated creation God has called good, beloved, Blessed, And to confirm the Trinitarian nature of this Messiah, the entire baptismal encounter and public epiphany is affected through the Holy Spirit, the Ruach of God, the very breath of life shared by every living creature the world over, given to each by a loving God like rain and sun, given by God to friend and foe alike. So we have in Jesus both kin and king, sibling and lord, and his public vocation, which serves as the story for the remainder of our church year, gives shape to this fundamental tension within each one of us, that we share a life limited in its humanity, 
yet expansive in its divinity. Captive to the interests and demands of our own time and place, yet always stretching our circle of concern to include all those beloved of God, and especially those most difficult to be near, those most difficult to love. This is the expansive vocation of Jesus and of all those incorporated into his risen and eternal life through baptism. As he was, so we are. As he does, so we do. Such is the shape and course of the baptized life. It is no longer us living, but Christ living within us, whose love demands we see every person, as Archbishop Tutu did, as a beloved child of God, such that we care enough to hope and to expect the best for each other, a mutual flourishing promised by God and effected by each one of us at every moment. The vows we make here this morning are nothing short of a new epiphany. On the one hand, a proclamation publicly of God's timeless delight in us, and on the other, our own wholehearted, full-throated yes to all the rights and responsibilities that come with affirming the true meaning and purpose of our lives in Christ. It was this clarity, this conviction, that gave Archbishop Tutu the courage to speak truth to power, the compassion to love the unlovable, the commitment to see in every face the spark of life, the imago dei. Friends, by the gift of the Holy Spirit, renewed again this morning, may our hearts and our minds, our eyes and our ears, likewise be so transformed and transfixed on God that we, too, live and love in true joy and deep peace, marked as we are as Christ's very own forever and forevermore. And the good people shout, Amen. Amen.